There's a lot of, tra of problems with the transport system, and I'm going to talk to, to about one of them, namely congestion. Well, as you heard, congestion is a major nuisance to all of us. Loss of time means loss of production and loss of time that we could use to, to do fun, more fun things. Uh, welfare, basically. Production or leisure or whatever you want to do. The thing about congestion is that we need to do something about it. I mean, all major urban areas suffer from congestion. It's, 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 just, it's just a basic uh, um, uh, fact of life. There just isn't more, ro more space to build more roads on, for example, because urban spaces are confined areas and the road is more available to do other things than just putting asphalt on it. So what do you do then? Well, the natural reaction for most human, humans would be to tell these drivers to be somewhere else. They should do something else, okay? They should do, go by public transport instead. They should travel at other times, perhaps, to other destinations. Uh, and transport planners, they are, um, like most humans are, they are prone to telling other people what to do instead. That's a natural reaction, especially if your transport planner goes with the word transport planner. You plan what, things, what, what people should do instead. Now, let me tell you a story about planning. Um, uh, at the time when the Berlin Wall fell, 1999, 1990, somewhere, uh, an urban planner in London got a strange phone call from a colleague in Moscow. Uh, hi, this is uh, Vladimir or something, I'm from Moscow, uh, and we have this slight problem trying to convert ourselves into market economy, and I'd like to talk to the person that's in charge of London's bread supply. Who's in charge of London's bread supply? And the urban plan in London was like, uh, <laughs> I don't know, I mean, uh, uh, no one, I suppose. Uh, but someone must be in charge of it. It's a very complex social problem delivering all those breads to all of these London people. And now here you have lots of good breads in London. Yes, we do, but no one's in charge. No one's in charge? No, no one's in charge. Ah, um, I have to think about that. And that's a very deep insight. No one's in charge. You just put the incentives and the nudges into place, and the social system will organize itself. itself. That's the power of self-organizing complex social systems. No one really plans this. No one can grasp all the details of the London bread supply chain system, but it works anyway. And if that insight had been in place in, let's say, Soviet Union 1920, lots of the horrors of the 20th century had, could have been avoided. The power of self-organizing system rather than trying to plan complex system. So, if you're a transport planner, you shouldn't exactly in detail plan what people should do instead. That's where congestion pricing goes in. The idea of congestion pricing is to tell, to nudge people away from the bad option. Don't drive your car at that particular bottleneck during rush hours. Do something else. At least part of you do something else. Uh, what you do? Well, I don't really care. I don't need, I, 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 I don't need to do, uh, I don't even need to know what you do instead. You can go by public transport if you want to, another time perhaps, another destination, another road. So, when solving complex social problems, don't plan the details. Give nudges, give incentives, and people will figure out how to adapt to this new framework, this new incentive. This is a map of Stockholm, and as you can see, most of the valuable land in the urban core is used for other purposes than just We have lots of um, water, which, which, uh, which makes the congestion problems even worse, and there are a number of bottlenecks on the bridge leading into the inter inner city here, where they develop and then spread out across these blue lines, which are roads. Okay? Here's the nudge. Why don't we just put a sm fairly small charge on the people going there through rush hours. One or two euros or so through the bottlenecks, like this, the red dots there. Okay, one or two euros, that's not, that's not a significant amount of money when you compare it to the running costs of the cars, the parking costs, the purchasing cost of the cars, and the time cost. So why would really that affect anyone? You would perhaps affect, that, okay, maybe one or two percent of the car drivers would choose something else, but, but you would be wrong. What happened was that 20 percent of the cars disappeared. Okay, 20%, that, that, that's, that's fairly good, but there's still 80% left of the congestion, right? Uh, now, the thing is that that's also wrong, because traffic is a non-linear phenomenon. Once you get above the capacity threshold, each car you add adds non-linearly, that is very, very fast to the congestion, and it also works, works the other way around. When you reduce traffic, you can get dramatic effects of congestion. Congestion charging was introduced in Stockholm on January 3rd, 2006. And this is January 2nd on one of the major arterials here. Uh, if you reduce 
20% of the traffic on this road, you get the, the situation January 3rd, the first day of the congestion charges, and it looked like this. This is what happens when you take away 20% of traffic. Okay, uh, but, but uh, maybe it works one day. Maybe, it, uh, I mean, do, don't people adapt? That's what you said, right? Okay, so drivers will just get used to it, and after a while they all come back. Wrong. We're now six years, more than six years actually, after the introduction of congestion charges, and we still have roughly the same amount of traffic that we had that January 3rd, 2006. But you see, there's a gap here in 2007. Yes, because we had this wonderful scientific opportunity that the politicians, in all their magnificent wisdom, decided to abolish the congestion charges again and then reintroducing it, giving us a twice scientifically controlled experiment with congestion charges. And personally, I'd like, to, 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 I'd like to, to, to remove it every once a year or so and then reintroducing it just for the scientific fun of it. Uh, but they, they wouldn't let me do that. So we will just have to do with this twice experiment. So, but it sort, of, it sort of captures the essence of it. Um, so what happens then? Well, as I said, it was introduced as a trial uh, first. This is July 31st. This is the last day with the congestion charges in place. In, in the middle of the summer, this is the same place, the same time, but now it's summertime, so it's much uh, lighter. The August 1st was the first day without congestion charges, and it looked like this. And you have to, you have to admire the drivers. They adapt so quickly. The first day, and they all came back again. Well, basically, not only 15 or 20 percent of them came back. It was more than enough to create those marvelous queues again. Uh, and what did 2007 then look like if you look at it on, on a year basis? It looked like this. Basically, all of the cars were back again, but not quite all of them. Of these 20% that disappeared, 5% never, never came back. So 5% of those drivers who had changed to something else, now the destination, now the mode or something, they decided that I actually like my new travel pattern better than I did my, use, uh, my, uh, uh, my, uh, my old one. That's also the power of information, of trying something new, and the power of habit formation. When you try something, you establish a new, ch new travel habit, and it sticks. It works both ways. You stick as a car driver, and you also stick as a non-car driver. But, okay, we sort of knew that, that traffic was non-linear, that people would adapt or so on, but what we didn't know was, that, was this. People liked it. I mean, when you introduce a prize on something, people don't generally stand up and applause. They hate you instead. Okay? So when this idea was introduced, 70% was vehemently against this. What happened when, the when, when, when this was in introduced was that support increased. People didn't get more angry, they actually get more happy. Uh, we are now back uh, over here, spring 2011, and around 70% are in favor of keeping the congestion charges. They're actually in favor of keeping a price on something that used to be free. This is kind of strange. Why might this be? Well, uh, let's think about it this way. Who changed? I mean, these 20% that choose something else, they must be unhappy, right? Okay, so let's track them down. So we did this huge survey where we tried to track people down. Who changed? We interviewed people before and afterwards and compared travel service before and afterwards and asked the question, who changed and where did they go? And it turned out they don't know themselves. <laughs> you can't track people down. Most car drivers that you interview are just completely... Um, certain of that they travel in exactly the same way as they did before, but apparently they don't. And why is that? Well, f one of the reasons is that travel patterns are less stable than you might like to think. P people change all the time, the world is changing, and you make new decisions each day. And one of these decisions are slightly nudged into the non-rush hour car driving uh, direction. That's enough to make this 20% direction. Okay, so people change their minds then. So who changed their mind? Who changed their opinion? And why did they change? That could be good to know for politicians. Turns out that more than half of them believe that they didn't change their mind. If you compare, if you ask people, what did you believe about congestion pricing down back in 2005? Somewhere around 60 or 50 or 60 percent said, oh, I've, I've always been in favor of congestion charging. Well, <laughs> well you might think so, but you, you were not because we tracked you down. Okay? Uh, so this is a strange thing. And this is also a very human phenomenon. We are very prone to sticking to one opinion. And if we, um, at one case, um, change our opinion, we, are, we don't really like this sort of 
conflict between our former self and our current self. But the heroes of this, of this story is actually the ones that made the conscious effort to change their opinion, because that's a very hard thing for a human to do. We, stick, we tend to stick to our opinion despite the fact of evidence. The heroes of this story are the ones that actually had one opinion, looked at the evidence, said that, hmm, maybe I should change my mind, because that's among the most difficult thing a human can do. As I said, if you want to do great things, don't tell people how to adapt. Just nudge them away from the bad options. And if you do it right, they might even like it. Thank you. <laughs>